I'm Anthony Leeds and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this next conversation uh, with colleagues who've worked in areas that relate to problems caused by obesity and overweight or at least where there is a component which is caused by the obesity and overweight. It's my pleasure today to welcome Professor Amy Simpson, the Professor of Orthopaedic Surgery at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, who's now going to talk to us about osteoarthritis. Um, Hamish, thank you for joining us. And could we perhaps begin by explaining to the viewers uh, what we actually mean when we're, we're talking about osteoarthritis? So osteoarthritis is when the, it's the kind of non-stick covering of the bone ends uh, is worn away. Uh, and then we have just bone rubbing against bone in our, our joints, which is extremely painful. So uh, anything we can do to try and prevent that happening uh, is uh, very beneficial. Because once you lose that smooth, uh, kind of white, shiny, non-stick covering, uh, it's, it's not possible uh, to regenerate it uh, with our current technologies. Mm -hmm. So, so the question then is, uh, what what ways have we actually got uh, of helping people in the early stages? So, presumably, um, medications to reduce pain. Um, what what other approaches have we got? So, medication, particularly for uh, which can be taken in the form of certain creams for ones that are uh, joints that are near the surface, uh, can help the uh, help the pain. Uh, there are various other supplements that have been suggested, although the evidence for them is is not uh, particularly kind of um, robust. But uh, uh, someone such as uh, glucosamine and chondroitin have been suggested. Um, but really, the main things that people can do to help are to uh, maintain kind of uh, a certain amount of exercise and actually uh, maintain their weight at the correct level. Um, for joints, particularly such as the knee. If you lose uh, it, one kilogram, it takes it's the equivalent of taking four kilograms off the knee. So it makes a massive difference just losing a little bit of weight off uh, off your kind of off your body it takes a lot of load off the joint. And it, it, so that's actually one of the most effective things that we can do to help people. Yeah, and losing weight uh, is actually described in most of the guidelines, isn't it, as being a, a core component of management? But actually. Um, we're perhaps not as very as good at helping people to lose weight as we should be in, in osteoarthritis situations. I think that's right. I think that uh, people are often advised to lose weight, but when we look, measure their weight again, when they come back to the next clinic appointment, it really hasn't changed that much. Um, and so anything we can do to try and uh, uh, encourage and support people to lose weight uh, is a massive help with uh, managing people with uh, osteoarthritis. Yeah. Now, re recognising that there were, is a serious problem with trying to help people with osteoarthritis to lose weight, as you know, my colleagues in Copenhagen actually ran through some trials over a period of four years in which they achieved an initial weight loss using a formula diet program uh, and then a weight maintenance program or a maintenance program which was comparing exercise knee strengthening exercises with um, maintenance of body weight and showed that first of all the really interesting issue was that you could actually help these people to lose uh, 10 11 12 kilograms on average in weight which is quite good in clin ordinary clinical practice if you gained that in somebody with knee osteoarthritis or hip osteoarthritis that would be an enormous help and they should feel very much better one of the interesting things we noted was that um, they pointed out that their sleep seems to be very much better, probably because they're able to be more comfortable uh, at night time. Um, and of course, this study was done in Copenhagen, so that at the end of the weight loss period, uh, individuals to whom I've spoken reported being able to do things that they'd not been able to do for some years, like get back on their bicycles and cycle around Copenhagen or get back up on the floor if they had gone on the floor to play with their grandchildren, which of course anybody who knows what it's like to have Quite severe osteoarthritis knows that these are the practical problems that uh, you're faced with. Um, so then we managed to maintain the weight on average in about two thirds of them for uh, up to four years, uh, maintaining around about 10 kilograms in body weight and maintaining then the, the pain reduction benefit. So there was a reduction of pain, which was very quick. So that was the work done in Copenhagen, which provided some of the evidence, uh, which has then informed what we might do um, in other countries um, and um, you I think have undertaken a, a, a sort of feasibility trial translation into practice. Can you tell us a little bit about that? 
Absolutely. And a lot of it was I think, kind of based on some of the early work that you had done in Copenhagen, because certainly some studies show that even if you lose 5% of your body weight, uh, there's a reduction in, in symptoms, particularly of, of knee arthritis. And if you can use 10%, which is what you were achieving, it makes a colossal difference to the, to the symptoms. So uh, what we did in the feasibility study was we looked at uh, people who we had put on the uh, waiting list to have uh, a knee replacement done. So these were people who'd got severe uh, knee arthritis to the level where uh, they were actually going to have to have a, a major surgery for, uh, for their arthritis. And we looked to see if we could give all of the recommended non-operative treatments, which consist of weight loss, uh, exercise therapy, uh, and the exercise therapy is mainly kind of uh, gentle ac activity, strengthening exercises for the thigh muscles, uh, but also kind of maintaining m movement and uh, just gentle mobility. Uh, those exercises coupled with uh, appropriate footwear, which means really that you're you're not using a hard heel to the shoe, you're just using a kind of a, uh, uh, some form of uh, shock absorbing uh, insole or shock absorbing heel on the shoe. And simple analgesia, not, nothing kind of complicated, no opiates, or, or just simple analgesia such as the, uh, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory creams. We were applying all of those in the preoperative phase. Uh, and what we found was that uh, of the, the ones in the pilot study, uh, four out of 40 in the pilot study decided not to go ahead with surgery because uh, their symptoms had uh, eased so much. Uh, which is really a, a colossal number, considering that these were all people who had such severe arthritis that they had been listed for a knee replacement. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the other things that we found from the, the kind of comments we had back, because we, we asked the kind of patients afterwards a lot in terms of how they found the, uh, the process, whether it was manageable. Um, it was incredible how they, they said it, it was actually, they found it relatively easy, which surprised us uh, and it surprised them. Um, and they, there was comments like we found we could change the habits of a lifetime uh, with uh, uh, just in this kind of uh, uh, preoperative period. The yeah. other thing that I think came up was that it's a lot of people have the opinion that they, they, once they have a knee replacement, they'll be more mobile and they'll be able to lose weight afterwards. But there's a number of studies have shown that that really just doesn't happen, that people have the knee replacement and they don't lose weight afterwards. So they still carry on with that. And that puts them at risk of the knee replacement working out uh, a big of uh, um, not lasting as long, wearing out quicker than it would if they had actually been of normal weight. So there's so many advantages, even if we don't stop people having a joint replacement, stopping the kind of uh, the complications from the joint replacement, stopping the, uh, the chance that it will actually kind of only last for a short period of time, that if we can lose weight before people have a joint replacement, uh, it is a massive, massive uh, help. So yeah. what it's kind of inspired us to do was to, is to go on from this and actually really try and look as if we can, uh, ways that we can spin this out uh, to, uh, uh, to the wider population, having shown that it's feasible to deliver this uh, intervention of weight loss, exercise therapy, uh, um, insoles and uh, simple analgesia uh, to osteoarthritis patients. Now, this would also be particularly uh, important in the United Kingdom, where, um, as a consequence of the pandemic, the waiting lists for uh, knee surgery are, are very, very long, aren't they? Several years in some places, I think. Yes, um, it's kind of at least uh, at least a year. It's very commonly uh, a year, and often it can be two or three years, uh, and in certain parts of the UK, even longer than that. So, um, helping people to uh, to what's called wait well so that they, uh, they don't deteriorate whilst they're on the waiting list because there is evidence that uh, people, whilst they're in kind of um, significant pain and whilst they have reduced mobility, they start to lose muscle bulk and they, don't, they lose fitness and become more frail whilst they are uh, on the waiting list. So if, uh, if you can actually kind of get people to follow this program that, that we're suggesting, it helps them actually maintain their fitness uh, and maintain their um, independence and their activity. So there's many, many advantages, particularly in the moment, at the moment with the waiting lists having got so long. Yeah. Um, one of the other points of interest, I think, is that um, uh, individuals with osteoarthritis are, of course, uh, more at risk of developing 
cardiovascular disease or indeed do so and have worse um, cardiovascular risk factors including blood pressure and one of the things that we found very clearly in Copenhagen was that this amount of weight reduction and then very good weight maintenance did result in a big reduction of blood pressure and a maintenance of blood pressure and the calculated uh, cardiac risks were actually considerably reduced and were maintained at a lower level so the cardiovascular risk is improved as well no doubt there were other uh, variables that weren't measured that improved. I don't, one other thing I should add, of course, is that when you're actually achieving weight reduction with a formula diet, you're providing all the micronutrients that are required on a daily basis. And we did measure vitamin D and B12 in those individuals and showed that whereas a high proportion were very marginally um, deficient uh, at the beginning, the weight loss with a formula diet did actually improve vitamin D and B12 status. So that would be another good thing to do, particularly as most of these individuals were older. The average age at entry, I think, was 63. Um, and so it delivers more than one beneficial outcome, I think. And your combination of different interventions uh, should and would uh, deliver several beneficial in, um, consequences, which is great. Um, so with with all the information just that we've that, got Tony, just just on that i mean your yeah. point about vitamin d is is very relevant because we see it's good for the bone quality and the bone strength but it also has a role in uh, helping the immune system and so it can actually help reduce the chance of infection and that that is one of the main main problems that we get after joint replacement is if somebody gets an infection uh, into the joint so anything we can do to reduce that risk is very helpful the other thing that uh, has been kind of shown in, in uh, some studies is that if uh, people who have a higher weight are more at risk of getting infection in the joints. So if you can actually reduce the weight, you're probably going to reduce the risk of infection. And clearly in diabetics, your other work has shown that you get improved diabetic control and that then can mean that people are at reduced risk. So from the vitamin D point of view, from the straight weight point of view and the diabetic point of view, all of those uh, aspects can uh, reduce the chance of infection, which is a great benefit from uh, individuals undergoing kind of joint replacement surgery. Mm. Um, an interesting consideration is that since uh, NHS Scotland and NHS England are rolling out the so-called soups and shakes diet for diabetes remission, and it's being taken into a third phase in NHS England because the weight loss results have been so good, although we're still awaiting some of the other results, um, we therefore know that that type of uh, weight loss program can be delivered um, effectively in a normal NHS context. In, in fact, it's done very largely remotely, um, apart from actually delivering the, the soups and shakes to people. Um, and since weight loss has always, for many, many, I suppose, decades, been a central component of the guidelines for osteoarthritis, um, and we have this evidence now, why do we have to wait for more evidence before we would begin to actually deliver this type of intervention, especially when we have so many hundreds of thousands of people who would benefit from it. I mean, I know from my own clinical practice, which was in a medical bariatric clinic, where I, people who happened to have osteoarthritis and who lost weight, symptomatically were very much better. And in terms of mobility, um, the speed with which they'd walk down the corridor to see you after they'd lost 10 kilograms, their sleep, which they reported is better. There are now studies from other groups in Copenhagen which show that sleep is improved even if you do not have a specific sleep disorder. For those patients who have obstructive sleep apnea, studies in Sweden and in Finland uh, confirm that a big weight reduction will actually improve obstructive sleep apnea, which we know is very common in heavy people, very common in people who have diabetes. Um, all of these things seem to be there and we have evidence yet somehow there doesn't seem to be a connection and a, a sort of willingness to think well maybe we should do something about it now and not wait another five years for another clinical trial i know that there are some people who take the view that we we seem to wait too long before we actually do something and um others who i've interviewed on this sequence of uh, programs have said you know it's extraordinary that sometimes it takes about 17 years for a piece of experimental work from a clinical trial to actually be translated into practice, which is, oh, it's exasperating, isn't it? But it just seems to take too long. Yes. Why is this? Why is this so? I think the, I mean, there's several problems we have at the moment. And one is that uh, uh, 
is it's not constraint forward to kind of, um, to just to prescribe somebody the the formula diets. We can't if somebody comes to the arthritis clinic, it's not straightforward and able to just put them straight on. So one is there's a there's a kind of a process barrier with that. The other one I think is that um, the mechanism of delivering the the uh, the soups and shakes diet along with the other aspects of the intervention. The, that's I think one of the things that. Uh, could be could be looked at because the feasibility study suggested that if you had a uh, a, a case manager a a dietitian or a nurse or somebody who was overseeing that that care and monitoring them their adherence to the uh, to all of these non-operative aspects was a lot better because as you say we know that if people do lose uh, 10% of their body weight or even even 5% their symptoms will improve but the mm. question is can you get a large number of people who come in to to adhere to the diet to stay on it and to and to keep on doing the other aspects the exercise and the other things so that they really do get maximum benefit from these non-operative treatments and and that's what i think where we need to look and see if there's a cost effective way of doing it but for, for us at the moment it, yes it's it's a bit frustrating that we we can we can advise people we can say to them it's worth you know it's beneficial to lose weight we, we recommend they lose weight, but we're not really providing with them at the moment with the mechanism or the support easily to do that, even though, as you say, the evidence is there and we should be able to. Mm. Um, now, of course, we've been talking about the United Kingdom, uh, but we our audience is an international audience spread across Canada, the United States, the Middle East and, and South Asia. Um, do we have any advice that we can give to people who perhaps don't have access to some of the things that we have here? Uh, so, for example, an individual who has, and it's very, very common, of course, among older people to have a degree of knee osteoarthritis. Um, what general advice can we give to them um, in the absence of having the sort of facility that we, we have here? So, I mean, I think if there's other ways to access the um, the inter type of uh, interventions we're talking about. I mean, there's, there's, there are other uh, means of kind of losing weight. Uh, so if you can't act, get access to the soups and shapes uh, diet, if there's, if there's other uh, support locally to help you kind of lose weight, then that is certainly worth accessing that. In terms of the exercise kind of treatment, there are some very useful uh, websites that have got uh, ex uh, exercise programs that are um, anybody can access those websites and, and can sign up to them. Uh, one in particular is the Escape Pain program uh, that people can access. Those two straight away uh, uh, are the it's almost the most difficult components probably to uh, to kind of uh, um, to get kind of uh, to get if you're not actually being prescribed them. The um, Simple analgesia, uh, certainly in the UK, uh, is that the analgesia I'm talking about is the one you can just buy from a chemist. It's a relatively kind of mild one that is a, is a cream that you can uh, just put onto the uh, onto the skin over your knee. And the insoles we're talking about are just the ones you can use for shock absorbing, so that they're ones that sometimes are uh, sold to to uh, to runners and people who just put them at the in the back of their shoes. So. Uh, it, it, those ones are relatively easy to get hold of um, but the exercise again if you can just access one of those websites that will give you a guide to do that and weight loss whatever you, you're able to kind of uh, uh, access locally yeah um so what i should add for the benefit of viewers is that we will provide information underneath the window that has the interview we will give links to, active links to the website so that they'll be able to go straight to for example the the one about exercise and so on. So that's very good. Um, so now, finally, um, let's come to the question uh, that uh, I know that you and I have had several discussions, and we both know what we'd like to do, and we both know like, we both know what we would like to see happen. Uh, suppose this is one of my standard questions, as you know, if we were able to find a, a, a grant of 2.5 million GB pounds, uh, what would you like to do? What would you like to see done with that uh, that grant? Well, the, for us, the best way to get this in to clinical practice is to show that it's a cost effective intervention. And that means running a randomized control trial. Uh, and as we say, it's not so much that the individual components aren't effective. It's looking at the way that we can deliver it in a cost effective way. And the, the 
feasibility study that we did looked at having a this kind of case manager who I mentioned was was either uh, it could be a nurse, could be a dietitian, but somebody with some clinical expertise who could oversee their uh, the kind of the aspects and help people adhere to the uh, to the non um, the non operative interventions. So that that trial. Uh, would actually kind of cost um, several million, million to run because it would need to be done over multiple centres uh, and involve uh, several hundred people and it would need to be kind of followed up for at least one year probably kind of two years so uh, it would need to run over that uh, run over that period of time uh, but that would be a way if we could then show that it uh, was cost effective uh, and could even be kind of cheaper than the current treatments because if it's postponing people's joint replacement, that actually can end up actually being a very cost effective way of, uh, of this treatment being brought in, um, as well as actually being safer from an individual's point of view. Uh, so there are there will be multiple advantages if we could run that uh, full scale uh, study to, uh, to demonstrate the benefit of these, uh, of these treatments. Hmm. Well, so I think I would conclude then by saying that I would hope that at some point that, that it would be possible to obtain the funding uh, for that trial because that's obviously the important next step. So um, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Henry Simpson and Edinburgh, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Thank you. A pleasure to see you, Tony. Thanks. Bye.